front of you, and I also would like you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, we'll be looking at verses 19 to 26. For those of you who have, uh, are visiting with us today, we're in a, uh, a 64-week series on the Gospel of Luke. We're at Sermon 53. We have 11 more sermons to go on this book, and uh, we're having a great time, at least I am. And um, this morning we're taking a look at Luke chapter 20, verses 19 to 26. Let me just sort of set the scene for you. It's been an incredible few days in the life of Jesus. He has ridden into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. He's been welcomed by maybe a quarter of a million people who are proclaiming him to be the Messiah. The excitement of the people must have been electric. They're thinking it's not going to be long. Jesus is going to rally the people. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. We're finally going to be free. But Jesus isn't interested in overthrowing Rome. He attacks the center of Israel, the temple. He attacks the leaders of the temple. He attacks the merchants and the money changers that are selling in the temple. And he finally clears out all the desecration And he's teaching the people the truth of the gospel and the truth of the kingdom of God. Many of the religious leaders are furious at him because of what he has done and what he has taught and parables that he's taught that are against them. And they've made a decision together that they're going to find a way to kill Jesus. So what they're going to do now is they're going to try to trap him into making a proclamation that will give them permission either to stone him or to turn him over to the Roman officials. And that's where we pick up our story this morning in Luke chapter 20, verse 19 and following. So follow with me as I read. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that he might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right? For us to pay taxes to Caesar or not. He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. And he said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were unable to trap him in what he said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. He sort of sends the the spies home because he has amazed them with his answer. But they're now going to get an answer. And they're sitting back saying, if Jesus says yes, pay taxes, the crowd may turn on him for encouraging them to pay taxes to a pagan country. If he says, no, don't pay your taxes, Romans who are watching what's going on in the temple courtyard... And everything that's there may consider him a threat or danger and arrest him and do away with him himself. Now listen to the core of the issue, though. The Jews had one God. The Jews were required by law to pay a temple tax, one denarius for every male in the family, and that was paid to Rome. It was collected by the religious leaders of the people of Israel. They couldn't pay it with a half a shekel. They couldn't pay it with a drachma, which they had. They had to be, it had to be paid in a silver denarius. A denarius had the image of Caesar stamped on the coin, and it also had stamped on the coin the words that proclaimed that Caesar was God. The Jewish people hated giving money to anyone who was claiming to be God. So having to pay this specific tax really bothered the people. 
So they wanted to trap Jesus. Is it right for us to pay Caesar the tax or not? And Jesus' response was very simple. Show me a denarius. So they got their denarius out, and he said, well, whose image and inscription are on it? And their response was, well, Caesar's. And he says, then give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what is God's. And that's it. And so we can go home now. You know, I looked at that, and I said, how am I going to speak for 30 minutes on that? And then I realized, you know, that was their issue then with government. What is our issues now with government? What is our responsibility when it comes to politics and government? You know, I interneted uh, Jesus as a Democrat this week on Google. You ought to try that sometime. It's amazing the number of scriptures that prove that Jesus was a Democrat. Um, you will be amazed at what they say. I think the greatest proof that Jesus was a Democrat, though, was he rode into town on a donkey <laughs> and not on an elephant. You know, I just want you to think about that. But I also Googled uh, Jesus and the Green Party, and I also looked at Jesus and the, as a Republican. I also looked at Jesus as a socialist, and I want to let you know there are amazing scriptures that prove that Jesus was all of them. You can twist the scriptures any way you want to make it fit what you want to believe. So here's the question. What does the New Testament say is our responsibility to give to Caesar? Listen to what it says in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. It should be on your outline. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth and I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. You know, the first thing we give to Caesar is our prayers. Whether or not you voted for those that are in government or not, we are to pray for them. You say, what do I pray for them? Get them, God? You know? No, you pray for wisdom. You pray for integrity. You pray for their relationship with the one true God. You pray that they would be uh, open to religious freedom. You pray that prayer from Micah, that they would do justice, that they would love kindness, that they would walk humbly with their God. Lift those prayers up before God for everyone that is in a position of authority within any of our areas of government. You would say, well, why should I do that? Well, you need to do it so the gospel can go out freely, so that people can be saved by putting their trust in Jesus Christ who died and gave his life a ransom for all. You know, we want to pray for our leaders so that the doors won't shut to being able to freely express the gospel of Jesus Christ in our culture. We want to pray that for our leaders so we can continue to meet in our churches without government interference. We want to pray that we'll be able to continue to take our testimonies out into the workforce. We want to pray that the airwaves will remain open for the spreading of the truth of Jesus Christ on Christian radio. We want to pray for our schools, that they'll still be open to letting organizations like Young Life and Athletes for Action to meet in the schools. We want to pray for our school boards so that they won't silence the witness of faith within our schools. There are so many things that we can pray for those that are in authority over us. You know, when Paul gave this instruction, he was asking Christians to pray for Nero. I want you to understand something. That fire burned in Rome for a week. 
Nero had started it. But Nero brought Christians in, Christian leaders, and he began to torture them until they began to give him names of those people that were really hostile or unsympathetic toward his ruling. Then he would go out and search for those Christians and bring those Christians in and torture them until they started disposing names to him of people that were in, I'll call them their home Bible studies, or had bumper stickers on their chariots that looked like a fish. And he, would, he wanted to gather more and more Christians in order to torture and persecute them. And finally, he realized that torturing and persecuting Christians in a dungeon wasn't really public enough. And so he took Christians into the arena and dressed them up in animal skins. And then he sent them to the wild dogs and the lions to be eaten for the joy and the entertainment of those that were in the arena. And then he realized one day that you could take a Christian and dip that Christian in tar and pitch and light them on fire and they would burn for three or four hours. And so he took Christians and put them on poles, dipped them in tar and pitch, and then he lit the arena so that they could have their games at night, lit by the burning bodies of God's people. Now listen carefully. We in America, we have never had a Nero. No. No, no, never. Never have we had a man like Nero. And Paul says to us, if you are under anyone's authority, pray for them that you'll be able to live in peace and freely share about Jesus Christ. The second thing we give our leaders is respect. Listen to Romans 13. That everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do not want to be free, or do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Boy, that's a powerful passage of Scripture. And it's written during the time of Nero. You know, we are to give those in authority respect and honor because of the position that they hold And they are in that position under God's permission. They are God's servants. You say, yeah, but they do a whole bunch of wrong things. Well, they're God's servants. Then you leave the results and the consequences up to God. You know, I love living in a free country where I have freedom of speech. And I'm delighted that I can use my voice and you can use your voice to defend what we believe that is right. I want to be able to voice my opinion, and I love to be in a country that gives me the right to speak freely, and I love being in a country that says I can vote on an issue, that I can get on an agenda. I have all kinds of rights in this country, and God doesn't say give up your rights. But he says we need to give honor and respect to those who are in authority over us. And the best way to do that is through prayer and through respect. I just want to say be careful how you talk about those who are in leadership when you're talking to other people. They're listening. You're talking to a Christian brother, that's one thing. You're talking to a non-Christian individual at work. And you're bad-mouthing those that are in authority over us. 
You're bringing a disgrace on the name of Jesus Christ by the way that you use certain words to put our leaders down. Number three, we give our service. You know, Daniel chapter 1 through 6 and Genesis 39 to 38 gives us two stories of individuals who served in government, Daniel and Joseph. They give us models of how we are to live in relationship to our governments, um, even pagan societies. Let me talk about Joseph first. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He ended up in Egypt. He served a master by the name of Potiphar. He served him faithfully. He rose in great esteem in Potiphar's mind. But Joseph was falsely accused of attempted rape, and he was sentenced to life in prison. While he was in prison, though, he served the jailer so faithfully that ultimately Joseph was put in charge of other inmates that were there. Word got out of, out of the jail that to Pharaoh that Joseph had the ability to interpret dreams, and Pharaoh needed a dream interpreted, so Joseph was brought to him. Ultimately, because of Joseph's ability to interpret dreams, Joseph was, uh, became a servant of the king of Egypt. He served faithful, or Pharaoh faithfully, and he was ultimately put in the number two position over all of Egypt under the king of Egypt. Now listen carefully. The king of Egypt had a totally opposite system of beliefs than Joseph. But Joseph served him faithfully and at the same time served his God faithfully. Joseph's a great example. You can do both. In 600 B.C., the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem, took all the young men captive, and Daniel was one of those young men. Nebuchadnezzar, is the king, and he takes all the artifacts and the special uh, religious symbols out of the temple of Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem's temple, and he sets them up in front of all of his gods, and he makes sport of the religion of Israel. <coughs> he loved to torture the people of Israel. Daniel said, I am going to serve God, number one. And if I die, so be it. But I will also serve the king if the king will allow me to serve him. So Daniel graduated, really number one in his class. He rises to a position of number two over the, in the empire. We discover that Daniel was a man of prayer, and he not only prayed to God, but he prayed for the king, and he served the king. I would assume that David's motto was very simple. This is where God has put me, and this is where I'm going to serve God, and this is where I'm going to serve my king. You know, I look at Daniel, I look at Joseph, and I say, their lives tell me that's why I need to be involved in, or we as God's people need to be involved in national politics, and others need to be involved in state and local politics. We need to get involved in borough councils. We need to get involved on school boards. That's why Christians need to become judges at every level, all the way to the Supreme Court of, a, of the state or the nation, so that God can influence our country through your lives as you serve this state or this nation. You know, the only reason, or well, not the only reason, but one of the reasons a nation will crumble is if Christians stop serving in politics, whether or not on a state level or a national level. That's why I'm so glad that Joe Pitts, who loves Jesus Christ, is serving our nation in Washington. You know, I may get frustrated with what I see in Washington, but I know that there are a couple hundred Christians down there that love Jesus Christ who are taking their Christian life into that arena, and they're trying to slow down the decay of our nation by letting their light shine before men and allow their saltiness to infect that community. Praise God for people that will serve our nation and our state. 
you know, we need to step it up. We need to get involved. We shouldn't back down. And we should allow God to work through us. When I was a kid, I remember the Prime Minister of Communist Russia saying to us as a nation, and his name was Nikita Khrushchev, he said, we shall destroy you from within. He's doing a good job. But that's only going to happen if Christians stop praying for their leaders, if Christians stop being respectful to their leaders, and if we stop serving in our state and our nation. It'll be our fault if Makita Khrushchev's words come true. We're the salt and the light of the world. And the fourth thing we give is our obedience. Listen to what it says in Peter. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and, and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against our soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself to, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, to the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For, if it, for it is God's will that by doing good you shall silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Powerful words. Bottom line is we're to obey every law that is in our nation. You know, I wish I could say that I was not breaking the law last night when I was driving, but I was coming home from Walmart, and I was driving 60 miles an hour in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, and I was amazed at the number of people that were breaking the law, buzzing by me at 70 or 75 miles an hour. And I started to say, shame on them for breaking the law. And I looked down at my odometer and said, shame on me, too. They would have gone by a lot faster. But, you know, it's our responsibility to obey all the laws. The laws aren't there as suggestions. They're laws. We're to abide by them, and we're to take that into consideration in everything we do. And when we obey the laws of God, we silence the bad talk that goes on about us as Christians because we're doing the right things. There's so many more things I could say, but the time is running out. But let me just sort of bring this to a conclusion. Christians are not going to agree on all politics, but we can agree to pray for our leaders, to give our respect, to give our service, and to obey the laws of our nation. But somebody's going to say, well, wait a second. Didn't Jesus say, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's? And the answer is yes. So what do we give to God? We give God our life. Remember Jesus said, whose image is on the coin? And they said it was Caesar's. Okay, now remember that. Listen to Genesis chapter 1. Then Jesus said, let us make mankind, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they will rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all his creation, them, all his creatures who move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So if we give Caesar our taxes because his image is stamped on a coin, then we give God our lives because we were created in his image. 24-7, we are to live knowing that we are created in the image of God, and therefore we are to reflect that image all the time. Now, sometimes obeying God's laws and obeying the government's laws are opposed to each other, diametrically opposed. Listen to what the Bible says. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty 
of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. You always have to obey God if what God says is in opposition to what man says. We can't reflect God's image if we obey the laws of men that are directly in violation of God's word. So someday it's possible that we'll hear that it is against the law to teach the Bible. It's against the law to teach about Jesus Christ. It's against the law to share the gospel with anyone. And then you and I will have to say, I must obey God rather than man. We're going to have to make that decision because we give God our lives because his image is stamped on our life. Let me close with this verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Amen.